Did any of the following actually happen as described in these scary stories? I saw a dog man on a city rooftop. Dear Scary Stories NYC, this started out about two and a half months ago by now, I suppose. My wife and I live in Dumbo, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn built up out of old warehouses and factory buildings. We occupy the top floor loft of a building that overlooks shorter, but still multi-story residential buildings in all directions. We began to hear a dog howling, or what I took to be a dog at first. Each time it happened, my wife would rush to the front windows and claim there was a werewolf on the roof across the street howling to the sky. I would laugh and ask her what was really there. This went on for some time, with her insisting there really was a werewolf on the roof across from us. Finally, I got fed up. One night, I actually got up off my butt and walked to the window to see for myself. Wouldn't you know it, as I approached, she claimed that the werewolf was running away. By the time I got to the window, I saw a roof with nobody and nothing on it that wasn't normally there. At this point, I admit I began to resent my wife and her invisible werewolf, and the two of us started quarreling and bickering far more than usual. My wife got her old digital camera out of storage and sat by the window all night, determined to prove to me that her werewolf was real. Of course, that's when the howling dog went away. No howling for over a week. I don't want to act like this was happening every night and then it stopped. It was random, unpredictable. It definitely happened more than just on the full moon, but it didn't happen every night. After a few nights with no howling, I started to feel really bad about not believing my wife, and I tried to make it up to her. Nothing worked, though. She wanted proof that the werewolf was real. She wanted a photo. She wanted to prove to me that I was wrong, but I already knew I was. She obviously wasn't pranking me, so either she really saw a werewolf, or she saw something that she interpreted as a werewolf. In Dumbo, there are some fairly well-off people. It's possible she saw an exotic animal from another country and misinterpreted it as a werewolf. Heck, for all I know, Maybe someone in the hood has a pet dogman or a werewolf. I'm not a zoologist. I don't know what animals are real or not, you know. At any rate, two nights ago as I write this, my wife and I were walking home from the supermarket together and some dirt and pebbles started falling down onto the sidewalk, almost landing all over us. Looking up, I saw Batman crouched on the edge of the roof above us looking down like a gargoyle. I mean Batman because it looked like the dark silhouette of a muscular man, but it had tall pointed ears on top of its head. And on top of all that, its eyes glowed brightly inside that silhouette. My wife had dropped her groceries and was poking me on the shoulder, pointing at the singularly strange thing I was staring up at. Before I could say anything, the figure darted away. Out of our line of vision, releasing some more dust and pebbles as he ran off. You don't have to tell me what I saw. I know what I saw. It's what my wife was telling me was there. I saw a dog man on the roof across the street. I saw a dog man in an old warehouse in PA. Dear Scary Stories NYC. I have heard you tell stories on your channel that seem to indicate the possibility that wildlife, including alleged cryptids such as the Dogman, may be encroaching on recently abandoned places. While not disputing that possibility, I want to tell you a story about this exact sort of thing happening way back before the COVID situation first began. In other words, I do think the dog man is real. I do think he seeks to fill vacuums left by departing human populations. And it doesn't seem so impossible to me that the situation might be worsening now. But this isn't a story about now. This is a story about a time long ago when all the restaurants were still open 
and people didn't wear masks unless they were bank robbers or it was Halloween. I had this job a few years back assisting an architect who did a lot of work for a few cities around where I live in Pennsylvania. One time, this guy who was seriously considering buying an old abandoned warehouse building hired my boss to inspect the place for signs of structural damage. I had to go along and carry these old school large size blueprints which he would check out periodically while we made the tour. I remember my boss wanted to start in the basement and work our way up but the potential owner insisted we start at the top floor and then progress downward. My employer asked him why, and as I recall, the guy just shuddered and said he was scared of the basement. Even up above ground, he seemed so shaky, jumpy, paranoid. He told us that the times he'd been there before, he was almost certain that someone else was in there with him, or else that they had just left. He wasn't sure if it was homeless people living there, or urban exploration kids having their little adventures, or maybe some third option, but he felt almost positive that someone was getting in and out on their own, maybe multiple somebodies. He would find things moved around or left in places where he hadn't left them. I have to say, his nervousness was getting to me, and I started to jump at every shadow just like he did. Many, if not most, of the building's windows were going to need replacing, and a large number of doors as well, but we hadn't come across any major structural damage on our journey from up in the air down to ground level. It was time to go down underground to the dreaded basement, and the potential buyer of the building said out loud that he hoped they had heard us by now. He hoped that Whoever might have been there in the basement when we first came in would have left by then. The guy was shaking like a leaf. Either he really had a strong feeling someone had been there, or he was crazy. But I could tell that he wasn't lying or making up stories. I asked if I would be needed down there or if I could go wait in the car. But I got such dirty looks from both of the men that I never even finished asking. We all walked down the echoing concrete stairwell into the darkness. Almost immediately, the owner announced that the lights were out down there and we all had to retreat to the first floor offices where he had stashed a large flashlight. I really resented the entire situation when we scooby dooed back down the stairs in single file behind one guy holding a flashlight. This didn't feel safe and I wanted to remind the architect guy that he had never signed me up for any health plan should I get injured. I didn't say anything, but I thought a lot of stuff. The owner walked off about 50 feet ahead of us and to the right, opening the fuse box that was there and messing about inside. The faint light from his flashlight dimly illuminated enough of the basement that I could make out a number of plain rectangular poles holding the ceiling up and what looked like a double door leading to a corridor toward the back. It smelled different down there than it had upstairs and it felt damper, cooler too. I could hear water dripping faintly off in the distance but it echoed in such a way that I wasn't certain what direction the dripping was taking place in. There was another sound which at first I found indistinguishable from the clicking sounds of the potential buyer clicking away at the fuse box, trying to get the lights back on. He was unsuccessful for long enough, though, that I was able to tell that what I was hearing was something separate from the fuse box situation. It was a clicking sound, though, and one so familiar that I felt certain I recognized it. It was a sound I had heard before, a sound I associated with friendliness and warmth. And yet, in that moment, I felt a sense of dread from it instead. Why? It had to be due to the context. This was a sound that in the correct context would seem friendly, but it didn't belong in the darkness in that cellar on that night. My mind searched for the answer which I knew that I already knew. 
my heart beating harder and harder with each ensuing second, till all at once an epiphany hit me and I realized I was listening to the sound that dog nails make on concrete. If you've ever walked a dog or even had someone walking a dog past you on a sidewalk, then you've heard that sound. It probably conjures up images of smiling, happy puppies, man's best friend and all that. It conjured up those images for me too, but I didn't feel any better about any of it. Click, buzz, the sound of overhead fluorescent light bulbs from the 20th century buzzing back to hideous life, and I blinked my eyes at the sudden greenish tinged brightness. While still momentarily blinded, a vicious dog began barking loudly at myself and my boss, and I could hear the sound of those dog nails getting closer, running across the concrete floor in our direction. Instinctively, we both backed up the stairs, desperately trying to adjust our vision to the light. At the last second before turning around and running back up to the main floor, I saw it. It was a dog after all, or at least it sure looked like one. The thing was, I was standing four or five steps above the cellar floor, and the face of that dog was straight ahead of me. In case I'm not being clear, that would have meant that that dog head was somehow eight or nine feet or more up off the ground. Both my boss and I were screaming like teenage girls being chased by Freddy Krueger as we ran up the stairs. I don't know if he saw what I saw, but we both had jumped out of our skin by the barking alone, and we both knew that we were being chased. As we exited the building to run to his car in the parking lot, then, at that moment, I am certain that we both saw what was chasing us. I know this because we looked back, saw it coming out of the stairwell, saw it spotting us, saw it begin running toward us, and then we looked back at each other making eye contact before we ran out of that building. I'm going to tell you what we saw, even though by now, you've got to have a pretty darn good guess. It was black, as in pitch black. I don't mean dark brown. I don't mean charcoal gray. I mean, this was an entirely black, furry, man thing. It stood taller than a basketball player. It was so wide it had to squeeze itself to fit through the stairwell and out onto the floor. It stood upright like a Bigfoot, not on all fours like most fur-covered creatures, and yet it had legs that looked like those of a quadruped, like a dog or a cat. It didn't look like its hind legs were meant to support the entire creature on their own, and yet it had climbed out of the stairwell in just the same way any human would. And the hairy, insane-looking head on top of this thing looked like a prehistoric wolf head from out of the time of the woolly mammoths, or maybe even before. I swear, if they wanted to make a movie about creatures from hell itself, they should make the creatures look like this one did. I messed myself on the spot, then I had to run to the car acting like I hadn't. That was the least of my worries, though, as I was absolutely certain that I was not going to be allowed to live much longer. I was not going to be able to make it to the car. I knew I was going to get caught, and I was panicked. I hyperventilated, and I found it hard to walk. My legs went all wobbly. When I got inside the car, I was feeling faint and I was seeing darkness around the edges of my vision. I was watching the doorway of the building to see if the monster was going to come out after us, but I was losing consciousness at the same time. It became hard to remember why I was watching the door of the building and why that seemed so important a few seconds earlier. I began to feel like maybe I should take a nap. Maybe things were actually fine. Maybe a nap was all I needed. After all, my boss was going to drive, and all I had to do was be driven. I remember feeling warm and protected, and I remember smiling. 
as I settled into the comforting darkness of unconsciousness. Bam! Something had landed loudly on the car hood, waking me up and causing me to bounce up out of my seat and into the roof of the car. In front of me, I saw teeth. I saw a tongue. I saw gums. I saw spittle flying everywhere. There was a pitch black canine type giant on the hood of the car, literally freaking roaring at me as though it were a lion and I was, I guess, a gazelle. I don't know what lion see, but I was that in this ebony dark animal's mind. I remember nothing else until I woke up in the parking lot back at my job, sitting in the passenger seat, alone in the car, and smelling badly. My boss had apparently driven us both back, and I was free to make my way home and get cleaned up. The next day I asked him what happened, how did we get away from the black roaring wolf monster, and all he told me was other cars scared it off. I asked him if he meant there were other cars in the parking lot, or does that mean he drove out onto the street with the dogman on the hood of his car, and then other cars scared it off? He asked me to close his office door, which I did. Then he shouted at me for the one and only time during the period I worked for him. He told me I was not to ever bring up that warehouse, that buyer, or anything that happened regarding either of them ever again. He got right in my face when he did it too, and he had no need to add threats to his order. I got his point loud and clear. I wasn't working there too long after that anyway, as it turned out, but that's a different story. I'm trying to remember anything else I can about the creature. It really was more human than ape. It didn't hunch over like a gorilla or a chimp. It stood tall and upright in the way only a human does as far as I know. The ears stood up and were wolf-like, but the head was so large, the teeth so massive and savage-looking, that it didn't seem to be a modern creature at all. I wouldn't have been surprised if I found out that the thing had time-traveled from the dinosaur days. It was the scariest thing that ever happened to me, and one of the messiest, too. I think this story demonstrates my original point clearly, though. Dogman was invading and habituating in abandoned human quarters even before the virus situation, so why would he not continue to do so afterward? But... Whether you accept that or whether you think dogman and werewolves don't even exist, I can tell you with assurance that I saw a dogman in an old warehouse in PA. Don't go anywhere, we've got another scary dogman story coming up in a second. Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet Solomon and all his glory in them could not fit in. Today's EP is Mary Gillies, who suggests that we consider the lilies. Because she supports us, we have more abilities. She makes us so happy that we get the facilities. Thank you, Mary Gillies, for being one of our favorite PayPal subscribers at peterbernard.com. Mary gets to see our weekly Sunday night secret uncensored dogman stories, and you can too. Just do what she did and join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or click the join link below this or any of our videos and become a channel member. And now it's time for that second Dogman story I promised you. It takes place in Virginia and so we call it The Windsor, Virginia Werewolf Dear Scary Stories NYC I started writing this to you calling it the Isle of Wight Werewolf because I thought it took place in Isle of Wight, Virginia. However, when I located the exact spot it happened, Google Maps told me it was Windsor, Virginia. Nevertheless, it was practically an Isle of Wight, so I want to make it clear that I was not on an island. It's a town in Virginia called Isle of Wight, and Wikipedia says it's been called that since the 1600s. So, I don't know, maybe it was an island back then. I have never heard stories of werewolves or dogmen from up here, 
But my aunt, who lives down near New Orleans, firmly believes there are werewolf-type upright walking canids down roaming around where she lives. That's like a day of driving to get to there from here, though, and I was not expecting to see what I saw where I saw it. I keep trying to figure out a way I could have imagined it, or seen an optical illusion, or reflection, or man in a dog costume. But I keep coming back to the unsettling certainty that I actually saw what I saw. I wake up in the night thinking, oh, it was just a dream. I didn't really see that monster, but then I remember, and I know that I actually did. I didn't expect all of you to understand why this would be so upsetting to me, but it shattered my worldview and knocked me off kilter emotionally and psychologically for a while. I had been raised by two good Lutheran people who told me each night that there were no such things as monsters. I never saw monsters throughout my whole childhood, so I grew up feeling strongly that my parents had most likely been correct. I became an adult who laughed at others who believed in or even suspected the possibility of things like Bigfoot. I'm ashamed to say that I was kind of a real jerk about it. I lost friends by being so callous to their reports of having seen Sasquatch. After my own dogman experience, I can understand now that they were traumatized by what happened to them. Especially my one friend who saw a Bigfoot lead in the night outside of his tent while he was camping. I think I would have just died on the spot if that had been me. Anything could have happened, literally anything. I don't think my nervous system would have survived it. My sighting happened at dusk, not at night, and it happened while I was driving. I was on the courthouse highway, and I remember vividly that I was coming up on the sign that shows an icon image of children crossing the road. That sign was on the right, as suddenly an immense, upright walking dog strode right out onto the highway. There was a brief instant when he was in the center of the road and the sign was to the right and their poses were nearly identical mid-stride. Maybe I have Bigfoot on the brain, but it was much like watching that old Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film clip, only with him walking from right to left, the opposite of the film. And of course, this thing was walking on dog legs. It was not a wolf. Of this I am certain because it did not have triangular or pointed ears. This looked much more like a St. Bernard, believe it or not. It wasn't colored like a St. Bernard. It was some kind of brown or dark warm gray, at least in the limited color range present that time of day. I'm trying to say it wasn't spotted. And no, it wasn't carrying a little barrel of brandy under its chin either. What it was doing was walking upright on its hind legs intently staring in front of itself as it left the woods on my right, darted out in front of me, and re-entered the forest on the left of the road before I even had time to hit the brakes. And yet, I want to stress that it was not appearing to run, only to walk quickly. It had to have been very large. I don't think it took more than four or five steps to make the entire trip. And as I said... It was not leaping or running in order to accomplish this. It held its head up tall, its tongue hanging out and panting, its front arms outstretched as though reaching for the other side of the highway. I do not recall anything abnormal about the creature's paws. They seemed to me like dog paws, but on the other hand it happened so quickly and I wasn't concerned with its paws while it was occurring. Rather, I was concerned whether I was going to run into it. Once it was past me and gone, I felt even more freaked out, because now something crazy had happened, but I could no longer see it. I could no longer gather more information about it, and yet I definitely had failed to understand what I was seeing. So, I was joking earlier about calling it the Windsor Werewolf, but it was an upright walking canine and not wolf-like at all. It was beefy and burly, definitely a heavyweight contender for the Dogman Championship, but 
I am very uncomfortable contemplating its height. Compared to the children crossing sign, the creature was much, much taller. I just don't want to think about it. I find it unnerving that something as large as I think that thing might have been could be walking around right near where people are living while they're eating their dinner. I would much rather think of what I saw as a hallucination or a trick of light or something. Maybe swamp gas. Because I don't like considering the possibility that I saw a real creature when I witnessed the Windsor Werewolf. The Donuts at Dawn. Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a report for you from the edge of a medium-sized city in the Midwest of a dogman sighting I made with my own two bloodshot eyes. If I told you where this happened, I guarantee that you would be shocked. I can't reveal that information though, because this happened directly in front of my business. If people knew there were dogmen in this area, it might kill off what was left of my already terrible traffic. I can't complain though, there used to be three other independently owned donut shops within walking distance of here, but now you've got to go deeper into the city to find one. You might say that the only reason we're still open is that we've picked up some of the customers that used to go to the other places. In truth, I think most of the customers go to one of the international chain stores to get their coffee and donuts. After all, there are still more of them than there are of us. I'm not telling you this to give you a sob story. I'm just hoping you'll understand why I don't want to give you my street address. I mean, maybe that's a mistake. Maybe I should change the name of the place to Dogman Donuts and try to make it a tourist destination in case tourism ever becomes legal again. So I own the shop, or technically I own the business entity that rents the store down below our apartment. I should say we own it, since I am married, but my wife only started helping me in the shop recently, since the virus situation started. Our son used to help me run the place, and I had a dream of him inheriting the business and someday carrying on after I was gone. He met a very wealthy young woman from New York, though, and now he's there, working at her father's company. I had hired a string of teenagers to replace him, none of whom lasted very long. And then, COVID hit. My wife works freelance from home for a few advertising and design companies, but she began rearranging her schedule to help keep the store open. We still need both of our incomes because we went so deep into debt opening the store in the first place. If you have any relatives or friends who have opened their own store or restaurant, I'm sure you already know exactly what I mean. No matter who's helping me out in the place, though, I have to go there first and start making that day's fresh donuts and rolls and breads. Years ago, back in the 20th century, there used to be ads for a famous donut chain that featured a guy like me who ran a donut shop. Waking up, exhausted, repeating the commercial's catchphrase, which was, Time to make the donuts. We open at 6 a.m., but I'm usually in the store before 5 a.m. There are exceptions, especially more recently. With reduced traffic, I can't bake as many things as we used to, and I have to pick and choose what to bake each day. A number of items we used to bake daily, I now make twice a week or every other day, trying to only make as much as there's a demand for in each week. So, I'm one of those guys who, as soon as he gets up, before he's even gotten out of bed, his mind is completely lost in thinking about his work. Time to make the donuts, indeed. So you can imagine my confusion last week, one night slash morning before dawn, when I was drinking some of our house blend and staring dumbly out the front window of our shop. And then, I saw something that I think belongs on your channel. It was one of those moments that you know you aren't going to forget. I could tell something was happening in my belly before I was able to lift my head and even lay eyes on the thing. 
there was that little internal feeling of, oh yeah, something's about to happen. But I didn't know what brought on that gleeful sense of certainty. And that's what it was. I went from feeling like a zombie and not really awake yet, to sipping some black coffee, to feeling an excitement inside myself bigger than Christmas, to looking up for my drink out of the window and seeing a seven or eight foot tall bipedal non-human humanoid. It was fur covered like an animal and wore no clothing, so I don't think it was actually a human being. Perhaps it was, but the head of the big guy was elongated like a long snouted dog. I suppose it resembled a wolf too, in terms of the head. The legs were bent funny, but functioned like human legs. I suppose I would have to say they were a mix of human legs and the hind legs of a canine, but they weren't exactly like either. A dog's hind legs are not big or wide enough to support the body standing upright for long periods of time, but the creature I saw appeared to always walk upright. It had a proud gait, reared back and standing up as tall as it could possibly be. He reminded me of my kindergarten teacher bothering me about my posture when I was a kid. This dogman would have been her star pupil. I began to wonder if teaching kids to stand up straight and tall is a remnant or leftover from an earlier survival mechanism. After all, the bigger and taller a being seems to be, the more he or she can intimidate potential enemies all around him or her. So now I've got you understanding that I saw a dogman walking on its two hind legs outside of my donut and coffee shop one morning before dawn last week. I didn't give you any idea of where my shop is. I imagine you're visualizing me living and working across the street from an exotic animal refuge or a large national forest. Nothing could be further from the truth. I really wish I could just give you my address and let you look at the block on Google Street View because it would be a whole lot less work for me, but I'll have to describe it for you instead. No, there is no forest across the street from my coffee shop. There is another row of buildings with shops in the bottom floor, although the only one still open on that side is the chain pharmacy. It's a two-way road with two yellow lines painted down the center of it, a typical city street like any other, although I do admit that we are the next to last block in town before you encounter a sort of moat of empty lots. And then there's the river. We have three trees on our side of the street and I think they have the same on the other side. This is not a place one would expect to see a predatory mammal. And it was not a place that one would expect to see a cryptid. Within an hour, there would have been at least three or four people out there who would have seen this thing along with me. It's just unfathomable that it could have been where it was. Probably the most amazing part to me personally is that it was walking out of the most populated part of our city. I mean, we aren't Los Angeles, but we are a city. And the idea that this bipedal dog-headed monster man was strolling around the main hub of our town in the overnight hours seems flat out impossible to even consider. It had to have been caught on someone's security camera footage somewhere. Mine only points down toward whoever comes in my front or back door. I don't have any cameras with a view of the street. I didn't think to get my cell phone until later, but that was due to the sheer intimidation factor of the dog man. So after seeing this thing, my feeling of excitement transformed into a feeling of panic. My heart beating hard with anticipation became my heart pounding in dread so hard that it felt as though it would explode. I ducked down behind the table in the front and peeked out at the creature. I mean, this thing was strutting down the center of the road right along the two yellow lines. It was like he was leading an invisible parade, like he didn't have a care in the world. And then... Right in front of my shop, he stopped. I gasped and ducked down further, peering out from between the legs of a chair. I thought for sure he had spotted me, and I was trying to remember if I had unlocked the front door yet. I probably hadn't, 
the store wouldn't be open for almost another hour. But then again, I was extra sleepy this morning, and I couldn't really remember much before that first sip of coffee. I closed my eyes and prayed internally for protection, but while my brain thought the words, my mind envisioned the dog man pushing the door open and eating me for breakfast. Opening my eyes, though, I was somewhat relieved to see that the dog man was stopped so that he could scratch himself. Don't ask me where he was scratching since you don't really want to know the answer to that question anyway. I stared at the dog man standing there, but I'm sorry to say I was not thinking or doing any of the things people ask me if I was thinking or doing. I was not studying his body. I was not sketching him. I was not running to get my phone and take a picture, and I wasn't studying him to see if he had a human or canine level intelligence. I was glaring at him and mentally trying to will him to leave. He was the most threatening thing that had come to visit our block since the robbery we survived in our first year, and I wanted him to go away. I don't know what I was thinking trying to will him away with my mind as though I were in a science fiction movie. But maybe seeing something you didn't believe really existed can cause you to behave in strange ways. The dog man, either by his own choice or because I had magically willed him to, continued strutting along his imaginary parade, and I felt as though the danger was over. I stood up and grabbed my coffee to finish drinking it. Just then, a dog barked outside. It surprised me, and I thought it was the dog man. Looking up, I saw the dog man turned around and looking down the road behind him, a curious expression on his face. Again, I thought he was going to look at me, and I freaked out a bit. The coffee slipped out of my hand, spilling on my hand and my shirt, and burning me in the process. I shouted out in pain, and when I looked up this time, I finally got my wish. The dog man was staring directly through the window of the store, right into my eyes. I ran to the door, checking to see if it was locked. It was, which meant I had needlessly run up closer to the seven or eight foot tall canine manster. Trotting up to the door curiously, the dog man leaned forward, fogging up the glass as he tried to get a better look at me inside the darkened donut shop. I remember mentally experiencing that big-headed dog thing chomping a bite out of my stomach, out of my legs, my head. I don't mean I experienced the pain of it. I mean I tickled as I realized how much of me would go missing if that big dog man decided to lean in for a taste. But nothing like that happened. Instead, the dog back toward the center of downtown barked again. And this time the dog man seemed a bit more concerned about it. He darted back to the center of the street and he trotted away much more quickly than before. I felt like I had just run a marathon. I felt exhausted, not to mention burned. I almost closed the shop down for the day, but then I remembered I can't afford to do that. So, yes, I did check the security footage of the front door, and no, I couldn't find any video of the dog man. I have no explanation why. The creature was close enough to fog up the glass, so it should have been exactly where it would need to be in order to be recorded. Honestly, I have no answer as to why there's no video of the animal man. I didn't check it right away. I looked after the store was open and my wife could hold the fort for a while. I was going to show her the footage and ask her what she thought it was, but I literally couldn't locate it. I don't know the exact time it happened, but I watched back everything from 5 to 6 a.m. and I never found it. For that reason, I still haven't told my wife about the incident. So, I now make a point no matter how sleepy or groggy I am, to carry my cell phone in my pocket while I'm in the store. If the thing comes back, 
I want to see if cell phone cameras can record it any better than security cameras can. You know, that got me to thinking. I hear stories of people who think they have dogmen on their property, so they put out trap cams. Nobody ever gets any footage of the dogman, though, and so it's led people to suspect that they know what cameras are and that they can sense their presence. But what if they're sort of like vampires who can't reflect their faces in mirrors? What if dogmen just don't record on video? Well, most of me is hoping that my experience was a one-and-done kind of thing. I mostly hope that I'll never see one of those terrifying creatures ever again. But a little tiny bit of me wants to get a second chance. One small sliver wishes I had one more time to really eyeball and take some pictures of the donuts at dawn. Dogman. Don't go anywhere, we've got another all-new Dogman story in a second. But first, I need to drop this new rhyme. Daniel D'Amico, he is Psychico. Better predictions than Jimmy the Greco. Or Harpo, or Groucho, or Zeppo, or Chico. Without dear old Daniel, we totally freako. If any Marx Brothers fans are watching, yes, I know it's pronounced Chico, but that didn't rhyme. You know what did rhyme? Daniel D'Amico. Please join us in thanking him for making this episode possible. In return for his contributions, we sent him links to our all-new secret uncensored scary stories each Sunday night, as well as the over 15 hours of archived videos available nowhere else. And you can see them too if you do what Daniel did and join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Or you can accomplish the same thing by clicking the join link under this or any of our videos. And now for our second Dogman story of the episode. This is a pretty creepy one, and we call it The World's Shortest Dogman Story. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a Dogman sighting to report to you. It was a horrible experience, and it really shook up my family and my dog. But we're all okay and we're moving out of this place by the weekend after next. I think we'll be safe here for that short amount of time because we're keeping the dog inside or when we take him out it's on a leash. He isn't allowed free roaming ability any longer after what happened or what almost happened. So we had an old dog house we had built for a previous dog and Chester would sleep in it most days when it was warm enough. I was in the kitchen washing stuff in the sink there and I was looking out the window at our yard. It looked like a mess because the grass had died the last time it snowed and now basically it was just a big muddy pile out there. I was thinking about how much work it was going to be to reseed the entire yard because at that point we weren't thinking about moving out yet. We were fine there until this next event I'm about to describe for you happened. Okay, so first Chester started barking like an insane dog. Really, like he just lost his mind. He was jumping up and down, and his spittle was flying all over. He was posturing. He was growling. And I stopped what I was doing to look out at him. He was glaring off to my left at something that was out of my line of vision. I wondered what the heck it could be out there. And all of a sudden, boom, Chester took off running to my left barking his head off like it was the end of the world happening. I grabbed a towel and began drying my hands so that I could run outside and make sure that dog wasn't going to cause any damage that I couldn't afford to pay for. But before I could even leave the window, yipe, 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 back came Chester running twice as fast as before, but this time with his tail between his legs. And a split second later, into my view leaped this man. I ran to the kitchen door to let my dog in and I got a good long look at this man. I don't know what else to call it. I suppose it came from the woods and it had to have been an animal, a creature of some sort, but yet it moved like a man. It stood with the posture of a man. It walked and ran and leaped on its hind legs just as we do. But this man 
had a head more like my dog's head than mine. This creature that stood every inch as tall as I did couldn't have been a dog. It had to have been a man. Our eyes met, and I slammed the inner door shut, locking both locks on it and calling the police to report a burglar in a Halloween mask. Already by the time I got through to the cops, the creature had left. I couldn't see it anywhere. I stayed on the phone with the police until their men arrived, and I looked after calming poor Chester down. He almost lost everything in his brave effort to defend my family. He's an excellent dog, and I told him so over and over. The police said they mostly saw a lot of animal tracks around. They didn't find anyone. They gave me advice, but I forget what it was. I had already decided that we were going to move, and it was just a matter of time until I convinced my wife as well. Even though she hadn't seen the dog man, she had seen the change in me and Chester after the experience, and she didn't want our kids living so close to that kind of an animal. If something doesn't officially exist, you can't get officials to help you protect yourself against it. You can't tell the authorities the truth about what's going on. You've got to figure it out for yourself. I'm not Superman. I can't take Dogman in a fair fight. He wins. We're leaving. That's the beginning, middle, and end of the world's shortest Dogman story. Does Dogman migrate by water? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a brief and fairly unspectacular dogman sighting to tell you about, but I mainly am hoping you'll let me expound on my theory about dogman migration. This is a creature that doesn't officially exist, and yet I saw it myself, so I tend to think it is in fact real. How can a real living predator that size evade capture and recognition by science going into the 21st century already? One of the ways I think it avoids being seen or tracked down is by using waterways to hide both its trail and to mask its scent. So many stories of Bigfoot include descriptions of the horrible stench associated with them, but so few dogman stories include scent memories of the witnesses. First, let me tell you exactly what happened to me, and we'll naturally get back to my theories later on. I think my own encounter lends credibility to my ideas, but you will be the ultimate judge as far as that goes. This all happened in a place that will sound far away to some of you Americans. It was in Port Lambton, Ontario, on a little path called Squirrel Island Road. In actuality, it's less than two hours outside of Detroit, Michigan, assuming you don't get stuck at the border for whatever reason. That's right, I saw a dogman, not very far from Michigan, home of the famous Michigan dogman. In fact, maybe that's exactly what I saw. I've come a long way to be able to say that. I was a confirmed skeptic regarding all cryptids and all weird stuff right up until it happened to me personally. Now, I don't know what to think. So, here's what happened. I was out hiking alone to be alone. This was about six months into the lockdown and my wife and I needed physical space from each other. I had camped out twice before, but this was just a day off spent hiking alone outside. I had been marching through the forest, confident that my GPS app on my phone would get me home safely when I came out from under the tree cover to discover it had already become very dark. I wanted to find a road to get my bearings as I was having difficulty interpreting what the GPS was telling me. I remember wandering through some bushes when I nearly got sideswiped by this giant, gray-skinned, hairy man racing down the road so fast that I think he broke the speed limit. I was stunned as I watched this completely clothing-free behemoth of a man run away from me. When I raised my eyes up from his butt, I saw that he had hairy dog ears up on top of his head. I ran out onto the road, which I have since learned is called Squirrel Island Road. 
I wasn't trying to run after him, only to get a different angle before he disappeared from view. He sure looked to me as though he had a dog head and weirdly shaped legs as well. He was a hairy man, but not entirely covered in fur. I could see that his skin was gray and that the fur or hair existed in patches of darker gray. It or he did not have a tail. I watched as this huge man, whose pecs were up at the level of my eyeballs, thumped down the road, shaking the planet each time either of his weird-looking feet landed. He ran straight off the pathway into the foliage, or whatever that is over there, through it like lightning, and I heard him splash into the St. Clair River. I was standing there stunned and staring, but when he hit the water, I suddenly got overwhelmed with this intense delayed fear reaction. For some strange reason, I felt scared that he was going to come back with reinforcements. It seems so illogical now. I was stunned still while watching the dogman and only terrified at the idea of its return. I ran out of there and got home as quickly as I could, which was not quickly at all. I haven't been able to get myself to go back out in nature since then, which I know again is very illogical. There is almost no chance at all that I would or could see the dogman for a second time in one life, even if I tried to or wanted to. I'd have a better chance of seeing a bear or a mountain lion than a dogman. Consciously, I know that if I prepare and bring bear spray and a GPS locator, I have as good a chance as anyone else. Subconsciously, though, I'm still freaked out by the dogman. I still feel like this thing is out there getting reinforcements, and that if I go back out on his turf, he's going to make me regret it. I always used to believe in psychology, in the sense that I thought if one can identify when one is behaving in an illogical manner, one can choose to consciously overrule this behavior like Spock on TV. Here I am, though, being ruled by fear and superstition, even as I am fully aware that that is what they are. My wife and I still need space from each other, but instead of me going camping, we just get on each other's nerves and bicker about it. Thanks, dogman. But the upside of my PTSD and my inability to think of anything but the dogman is that I think I may have possibly noticed a pattern. That dogman I saw was running like he was in a hurry, yet nothing ran after him. Nothing was chasing him. He had some place to get to. For him to be in a hurry and to jump in the water seems to imply that he was going to use that water to get to some other place. If you swim across the St. Clair, you know where you get to? You get to the United States. The river is the border between the countries. That river flows between Canada and the United States, and certainly fish travel from one to the other, using it every moment of every day. So, why not a dogman? Think how many dogman sightings happen near the Great Lakes. Could that be a coincidence? Or could dogman be using those lakes as superhighways? There are legends stretching back into the past about mysterious disappearances on the lakes. Could Dogman be a factor in those mysteries? When I was very young, the only place in the country that I knew of that thought werewolves were real was down in Louisiana, especially around New Orleans. The rest of the country, as far as I can remember, thought werewolves were from the movies. Down there, however, tales were told of the Lugaroo or the Rougarou, a kind of a wolf said to be a shape-shifting human being. Is it a coincidence that New Orleans is surrounded by water? Or is there really another species of dogman living in that region? And does it disguise itself and make its quick getaways by using the swamps and lakes and waterways all around the area? Some people like to say that there is no such thing as coincidence, but I think that sometimes there really is. In this case, it really might be a coincidence that Dogman is so often sighted near water because it might only indicate that he needs to drink, same as every other animal on the planet. I saw the creature go into the water, so I do know that it can happen sometimes. That by itself does not prove that it's a means of transportation for his species. 
Maybe the dogman jumped in because he saw a fish and was hungry. After all, I ran away, and I don't know what he did after he hit the water. A dogman diving into water one time does not prove that the entire species is semi-aquatic and migrates annually using rivers and lakes and marshes. Right now, it's just my daydream. It's just me wondering. I wanted to share it because it's possible that someone out there will eventually be in a position to either prove or disprove it. I know I won't because I'm not much of an outdoorsman anymore, not since seeing the dog man. I do still wonder about this and it nags at me since I feel powerless to validate or invalidate the theory while sitting at home every day. That doesn't mean I believe my ideas or that I'm trying to get you to believe them either. We should, all of us, please return to only believing things that we are certain to have been proven. That's harder than ever to do these days, as it seems so many people are placing their agendas and dogma above facts, but at least so far, we can still breathe deeply and live in the reality-based universe. Just because I tell you I saw a dogman and that I personally know it to be real does not mean you should emotionally feel certain of the reality of the dogman. You don't know who I am, and you don't know that I'm not trolling your old pal Bigfoot. I have no photo, I have no video, I saw no footprints, and I have no proof. All I've given you is a story. I have made unsupported assertions. If you told all this to me, I would keep an open mind that you might be telling the truth, but I would remain skeptical for the most part. So should you. Not just about my story, but every story you hear anyone tell about any subject at any time for any reason. You don't know if I have an agenda. You don't know if I work for an organization with an agenda. You don't know that I'm not brainwashed by some agenda or another, and you don't know that I'm not a comedy student playing a practical joke on the public to impress my famous comedy teacher. You also don't know if I'm not just crazy. I might be seeing things on the one hand, or I might be openly lying in your face because I'm a narcissist or a sociopath on the other. I will say this, since that time, wherever I go, I set my phone up to record before I step out. I take a lot more pictures now on my phone. It's fun and it helps me appreciate my surroundings, but it also keeps my phone at the ready so I have a better chance of capturing anything weird if it ever happens to me again. I don't really expect to see a dog man again, but my mind has been torn open since that experience. I am afraid to go out in the woods any longer, like I said, but to be honest, I'm afraid to be in bed at night, too. I never really believed in any monster or UFO stories before, but now I'm open to the possibility that any and all of them might be legit. Which would mean, if that were true, that we are never safe. In the woods, or at the edges of our towns, we might run into boogeymen like Bigfoot or Dogman. In our own homes, we might be greeted in our beds by old hags, or shadow men, or hat men, or ghosts. On the other hand, aliens might walk through our bedroom walls and take us away with them to do horrible things that they apparently learned from Hieronymus Bosch and the Marquis de Sade. I'm not saying I believe in any of that. I'm just saying I am no longer so certain about not believing it. Does that make sense? It humbles you seeing the dog man. At least if you're one of those people who uses words like science when we really mean dogma or deciding before all the evidence is in. Siding with those in power rather than following the path of honest truth. I felt haughty. I felt superior. I knew I was the smart city guy and that those country bumpkins were dumb because they believed in monsters. Ha ha ha, those stupid yokels. Well, I'm the yokel now. I'm the dum-dum who's the butt of jokes because I committed the unspeakable sin of seeing something that was in front of my eyes. There is such stigma attached to going public about a monster sighting in my circles that I will no longer admit that I even saw it. I wish I could engage with others interested in the topic, but I have to keep my job. If I can somehow someday afford to retire, 
which seems less likely by the month, then maybe I will be able to eventually risk attaching my name to my sighting. I don't think my wife would want me to talk about it even then, though. I have a feeling I will spend the rest of my entire life wondering, <laughs> does Dogman migrate by water? Don't go anywhere, we've got another all new Dogman story in a second, but first, I know a guy so cool it's sick. He's the man who is quite thick, It's more badass than you and me. Talk about Thick Man 863. Please join us in thanking Thick Man 863 for making this episode possible. Thick Man is our newest $7 channel member. That means he gets access to our secret uncensored Sunday night stories, as well as our archive of over 15 hours of Dogman stories far too wild to ever run on this channel. You could check him out too by joining our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or by doing what Thickman863 did and clicking the join link under this or any of our videos. And now, for a second Dogman story of the day, and we call this one... The Angel Fire Dogman Dear Scary Stories NYC, This happened outside of Angel Fire, New Mexico. If you aren't from around here, Angel Fire is about three hours north of Albuquerque, or five hours drive north of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. It's a small town, but anyway, this happened in the country outside of the town to the west. I almost lost my little dog that I had brought with me to what I now call the Angel Fire Dogman. My dog and I were feeling very cooped up, as are most of us, and I'm sure most of those listening to this as well. We took a day off walking into the countryside to the west of town, getting lost in the forest for a little while. I mean lost in a fun sense, not literally lost. I had my GPS thingy working, and I just knew we had to head back east when the sun started setting in the west. We didn't end up staying in the woods that long, though, as the dogman had other plans. We came out of the thick trees into a huge grass field, that looked like it had been made just for my dog to play in. He began cavorting, romping, and any of those other words they use when a little dog freaks out in happiness in a giant grass field. I was laughing really hard at what an idiot he was acting like, and he kept running back to lick me on the face before returning to his wild, solitaire antics. It was a fun moment for both of us, but I started to get a really weird feeling in my stomach that something was wrong and it made me take a good look around us in all directions. Off ahead of me to my right, at the edge of the wood line off in the distance, I swore I saw what seemed to be a very large man standing there at full attention. It was easier to see him peripherally, but when I would look directly at the area I thought he was standing in, I wasn't so sure that it wasn't a trick of the light or pareidolia. All of the trees were swaying a bit in the breeze, and the leaves and branches swayed somewhat independently from the trunks. The sun was fairly high in the sky. This was either just before or just after midday, not in the middle of the night like most dogman sightings. The sun was extremely bright, and I was not wearing sunglasses as I probably should have been. The result was that I squinted and shaded my eyes and was clearly staring where I thought the big man was, trying to figure out if anyone was actually there. Well, that humanoid in the shadows didn't like being stared at in such an obvious and rude manner. He took two or three bipedal steps out of the darkened tree cover, and the sight of him literally took my breath away. I don't mean I fell in love with him. I mean I was so stunned that it felt like the breath was being sucked from my lungs, and I was gasping for air in a literal sense. It would be hard for me to guess at the height of the thing because he was so far away, but he reminded me of a recurring dream I've had since I was a kid about a living statue in our town. It always really creeped me out. In my dreams, it would peek out from behind corners at me, from way up in the air like 14 or 18 feet, whatever height that statue was or is. I don't remember who it's a statue of, but I remember it looked down on the people in front of it with an expression that I guess was supposed to resemble a smile. To me, it was anything but a smile, and those nightmares lasted throughout my childhood. 
into my teenage years. This was like that, but this was not a man, smiling or not. I was witnessing some kind of an animal, like a bear, but not a bear. It was furry like a bear, but it was too tall, and the body shape, the way it moved, they were far more like a human being than any other kind of creature. That's not to say I was witnessing a human either, because I was not. I was seeing something with upright, erect ears on top of its head, and the snout was so long that at first I thought I was seeing a giant ant eater. The ant eater opened its jaws, though, revealing long, sharp rows of teeth that seemed proportionally too long and too large to fit in that creature's immense mouth. It was a dog, but it wasn't a dog. It was a dog-headed monster man. It was growling at me, bearing those elephant tusks that served as its teeth at me, and I backed away, preparing to remove myself from that situation. If that dog-headed man said this field was his turf, then he could have it back with my sincere apologies. Just then, my little dog took off yapping across the grass, running directly toward the dog man. I couldn't believe it, and I also couldn't believe that I took off after him, running as fast as I could. I was racing towards certain painful doom, but I had to grab that stupid dog before he got both of us killed. Or worse. Each time I was about to be able to grab him, he'd speed up the little psycho. I was in the process of deciding when I was going to have to stop trying to rescue my little best friend. Feeling so sad, my eyes were welling up with tears. I didn't want to lose that dog. He was such a good buddy of mine, and yet he wasn't giving me the option of saving him. And then, the dog man overruled both of us. He shouted at us with a sound so loud, it felt like I was being hit with a solid more than a combination of gases and vibrations. They used to call the Phil Spector style of music producing the wall of sound, but that was because they never got shouted at by the dog man. My dog and I experienced the real wall of sound, and when we did, my dog changed his mind about which direction he should be running in. Suddenly, my dog was running at me. And... So was the dog man. I was completely out of breath, but now I needed to move my legs more than before. My lungs felt like they were going to implode. My legs felt like they were going to seize up. My belly and sides felt like I was going to pass away if I took another step. Yet I kept going, somehow, finding that the fear of what happened if that dogman caught me could generate energy on its own. I don't think the dogman was actually pursuing us as prey. I think he was just scaring us off. My supporting evidence for that is this story itself. Both my dog and I live to tell the tale, after all. I think that dogman would have finished us off if he saw us as prey. I don't see how we could have escaped him. I think he was just telling us to get off his lawn, so to speak. We went back home to Angel Fire, and it was like nothing had ever happened. I fed my dog some dog food. I went on YouTube to look for old movies to watch. Nothing caught my interest, though, because something inside me had been freaked out and forever changed by the incident. I looked out the window, and everything looked the same. But when I looked inside myself... Everything had been changed by the Angel Fire Dog Man. Welcome to Scary Stories. I'm your old pal Bigfoot. My basement apartment got flooded out in this latest snowstorm, so I fled to a rectangular cave way up on the side of a tall square mountain here in Manhattan. The people who used to be here seemed unhappy on their way down, but hey, a Bigfoot needs a secret lair, and now this one is mine. I've got two new Dogman stories for you, neither of which happened here in Manhattan, but I'm gonna run footage of the snow here, because that's what I've got to run. I hope you don't find that too confusing as we dive into our first tale, which we call... The Dogman in the Snowdrift. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I was having one of my only fun days of the past two years, and it was all ruined 
by this creature that you've been promoting lately, namely the dog man. Don't get me wrong, I don't blame you. I know you didn't create the dog man. I just think you shouldn't talk about him so much because it makes him bolder. It makes him more likely to appear out in the open. You know what I'm talking about. If you make me think about him, then he can tell that I'm thinking about him and it makes him behave in a more brazen manner. The more they know they're in our head, the more likely it is that the dogmen will appear in your life and get up in your face. If everybody would just stop thinking about them and stop talking about them, the dogmen would get depressed instead of us, and their self-esteem would suffer instead of ours. Then, they would go back to appearing only rarely, which is the way nature intended it to be, I think. We have knocked nature off balance with our lockdowns, and now we need to balance nature back out, or we will find the tipping point will have already passed, and it will have tipped in favor of the dog man. I was out walking after the recent snowstorm in our area. I was with my sister, and she reminded me that we used to make snow angels when we were kids. It was the perfect day for it and the perfect snow for it, so we decided to make some adult-sized snow angels. She went first on the grass alongside the sidewalk. I did one in the driveway of our atheist neighbor because nobody needs the blessing of an angel more than that poor fellow. My sister is much smaller than myself, so she was able to choose more interesting locations to leave angels. This made me jealous and also forlorn, missing my youth when I was as small as she still is. After she made a snow angel on the hood of an old 1972 Chrysler, I couldn't stand it anymore. I wanted to leave a snow angel that would make a statement too. A snow angel for the ages. Looking around, I caught sight of a snow drift in the abandoned tree-covered lot down the block from my house. It was large enough for me to lean back on, and it was upright enough that it could be seen from the road. There, I would make a snow angel magnificent enough for the true angels, a snow angel for forever, for all time. Saying a silent prayer of thanks for this opportunity, I dedicated the results of my efforts to our heavenly creator, without whom there would be no snow to lie down on in the first place. With such lofty spirit and intentions, I had no idea how close I was about to come to real, true, pure evil. I called out to my sister to watch me exactly in the same way we both used to when we were kids. And in exactly the same way as always, she walked in the other direction and did not watch me. This, of course, doubled the danger I was in, but I still had no idea that anything was even slightly out of order. By the way, I sometimes hear stories on your channel, I think, or maybe someone else's channel, where people talk about smelling the dog man or sensing the heat emanating off the body of the creature. Neither of these things happened in my case, although obviously mine occurred out in the snow. So... When I walked back to the snowdrift in the field, I was blown away by what almost looked like an optical illusion. I had thought it was three and a half or four feet tall and about 20 feet in off the road. Once I was past the bushes and tall weeds at the edge of the property, though, I could see that this snowdrift was almost twice as far away from me as I had thought and almost twice as tall as well. With the bright afternoon sun shining on the white snow, viewing through a break in the outer wall of foliage, it was easy to misinterpret the depth and height of the wall of snow. It was wide enough that I could actually make four or five snow angels if I had my smaller sister make shorter snow angels in between mine. It could be the snow art event of my family's entire history. I went back out onto the street found my sister, and dragged her back to the empty lot, explaining my master plan. She seemed skeptical, but willing to collaborate, as long as I went first. 
She noticed before I did that the pile of snow was on top of a flat-looking platform of stone, which was a foot or two high itself. Mutually agreeing where I should attempt my first angel, I leaned back gently into the snow, which was far less dense than I had anticipated. My sister let out a little yelp as I fell back about a foot into the snow. I was about to laugh when I heard an angry sound from behind and underneath me, like a really big man was about to get up out of that snow. I flipped up into the air in a more acrobatic way than I knew I had the ability to do, and I tiptoed over to my sister in a very unmanly manner. She wasn't making fun of me, though. She was at first watching the snow drift behind me in horror, and then, before I had even reached her, my sister had turned away from me and began running back toward the street. My adrenaline kicked in and I raced past her to the sidewalk, imagining a giant homeless person rising up out of the snow, carrying all sorts of weapons behind me. When I reached the concrete, I turned around to see what was actually happening, and my sister almost ran me down, fleeing past me. What I saw when I looked back was a far stranger sight than any I could have imagined. I saw... A werewolf, just exactly like in the movies. I mean, like the howling, basically, like a hairy man with a wolf head, that kind of werewolf. It had legs like the hind legs of a canine, the whole nine yards. It was exactly the kind of thing that you talk about on your show. It was the dog man, and it had been sleeping under that snow drift for whatever reason. While I was standing there watching him as though I had paid admission to the zoo, the creature grew as annoyed of me as anyone would have. I mean, I was gaping. I was being rude. And this hero looked to be an apex predator nine or ten feet tall. Just ridiculous. Like the Anunnaki were visiting our neighborhood. He grunted and acted like he was going to chase me. And I ran home crying like a baby. I don't think he really ran after me. I think he just faked me out. But it didn't matter. I knew better than to look back. It might only bother the huge thing further. Once we got home, my sister started lecturing me that we didn't see anything. And that if I said we did, she would insist I was making it up. Who needs the men in black when you have my sister? She also told me other very unfair things that she would do if I dragged her into this or if I talked about it on any of my social media. Very unfair and extremely personal things, places I can't believe she would threaten to go. So I have to do this anonymously and I can't ask her for corroboration. She calls it a Bigfoot anyway. She's ignorant and brainwashed by social media. No Bigfoot that ever lived had dog ears up on top of his head and the face of a wolf on top of his shoulders. That was a werewolf or that was a dog man, but that was not a Bigfoot. I look at the world in a completely different and more respectful way now. This was kind of an adult equivalent to that moment from my childhood when my Sunday school teacher lifted up a flat rock and revealed an entire city of bugs hard at work underneath it. The world has a lot more going on behind the scenes and under the surface than we usually take time to realize. It's magical in one sense, but terrifying in another. Magically terrifying. That's what this experience was, and that's what my entire life has become since then. I know the chances of something that strange happening again in one lifetime are very small, but on the other hand, I keep a great distance between myself and piles of snow since then. If there's a lot of snow piled up on your sidewalk, I may walk in the middle of the street instead, just to be on the safe side. I keep thinking I see dogmen emerging from under things or behind things, I keep thinking I hear him behind my back. I have to force myself to leave the house for necessities. The entire world seems alive to me, but 
not in a nice way. It's more like an unending nightmare where the dogman might be anywhere I go. The more I try to keep away from him, the more likely I am to run into him again, the same way I did the first time. By accident. I have a lot of questions about this event, so many that I might not remember them all. Was the dogman sleeping on the ground and then covered in snow by the wind? Did the dogman dig into the snow to sleep from the side of the drift that we did not see? Is covering oneself in snow a regular practice of this animal? Could it have been sick or injured or hungry and only passed out on that spot and then been covered by the snow afterward? What exactly did I witness? Was this a random occurrence? Or does this tell us something about the dogman that we didn't know before? Could they be sleeping all around us? Could they be hiding in plain sight? Is there a dogman behind every rock? Is there a dogman sleeping up in every tree? Am I becoming paranoid? Am I becoming delusional? The one person who could help me by talking with me about it calls the creature a Bigfoot. I'm locked in my head, unsure of what is real or what is imagined, and with nobody that I can use as a sounding board to tell if I'm making sense. I feel as though insanity is a place on the map and that I moved into this location on the day when I leaned back and fell right on top of the Dogman in the snowdrift. Don't go anywhere. We've got another Dogman story to tell you. But first, please join us in thanking today's executive producer, Jeff Underhill. If you want a man that fits the bill, don't overlook Jeff Underhill. Are you deaf, not Steph, or Yousef, Mr. Underhill, whose first name is Jeff? Please join us in thanking Jeff Underhill, who is our newest $10 channel member. That means he gets to see our secret, uncensored Sunday night stories like all our channel members do, and he gains access to our 15 hours of archived secret, uncensored stories available nowhere else. But more than all that, Mr. Underhill gets to see our shows as soon as we upload them and not the next day or later that night or whenever everybody else sees them. Why? This video you're watching right now, Jeff Underhill saw it yesterday. That's how badass Jeff Underhill is, and you can be too. Just click the join link under this or any of our videos to become a channel member and be the first person on your block to actually be as cool as Jeff Underhill. The power is in your hands, and the power is in my hands to start telling you what you came here to be told. Our second snow-covered dogman story of the day, and this one is called... I Saw Dogman Hitching a Ride Dear Scary Stories NYC This is a story that's hard for me to tell, not just because of how upsetting it is to remember these traumatic experiences, but also because people think I'm a creeper when I tell it. You see... The story starts with me going back to the school I used to attend years ago, and then hanging out in the woods off of Westchester Road the way I used to when I was a student. But I wasn't doing any of that for creeper reasons. I just went there because it was a place that used to make me feel better. I could really use something that makes me feel better these days, and that's why I went to those woods. It wasn't really working. It wasn't making me feel any better, but I was too exhausted to do anything else, so I sat there under a tree, getting cold. I could hardly hear any sounds except the wind, and I knew I'd better get up and go home, because I wasn't going to be able to plug back into reality in those woods anymore. And then, as if to underscore that point, something so completely unreal happened that I now doubt my sanity every waking moment. I was getting too cold to remain, and I knew that soon I would be too cold to move. My listlessness was hard to lift, though, as so much of what had always mattered to me in life has been stripped from me by the powers that be and handed over to the people who already had too much. I needed a reason to get up and fight back one more day, 
and I got it, but I got it in the strangest way I could possibly get it. There were sounds of the approach of a very large person or animal. I noticed my alertness return immediately, so I do still have a survival instinct. Rising to my feet, I wondered if I should call out to whoever it was or if I should just run. I wasn't a student, and I had no real right to be there, so I hoped it wasn't security. Well, huh, it was not security. I saw its head first because it was so absurdly tall. Imagine a wolf head way up in the air. My stomach turned. The world felt topsy-turvy. I wondered if I had inhaled fairy powder while resting under that tree. I was confused. I was frightened. I was alarmed. And I was shaking all over, but you know what? I was no longer bored or depressed in the slightest. The wolf head way up in the air saw me, and our eyes instantly met. I heard a voice in my head telling me, It's time for you to lie down and sleep. I screamed. I screamed and ran and kept screaming, as though I had the lung capacity of a bull elephant. I remember seeing the man behind me. It was not an upright dog. It was a huge man with a canine head and ears. When I would look at him, I would feel dizzy, and I would hear him saying terrible things in my ears. So I stopped looking at him, and I just ran. I remember running across a baseball field. I remember seeing the train station in the distance, and I remember running up the ramp onto the train platform. Up there, I could see further and I could see in all directions for the most part. I didn't see that dogman anywhere. It didn't calm me down in the slightest, but I didn't see the dogman anywhere. A train pulled into the station heading upstate. I had originally planned on getting whatever train stopped there first just to get away from the dogman. I hadn't seen him the entire time I'd been on the platform, though, and I was pretty sure he had retreated back to the depths of the forest that I presumed he had come out of in the first place. The train's car doors opened invitingly in front of me. It sure looked nice in there. Comfortable. Safe, too. No werewolves in there. Oh, I ached to get inside. I could ride to the end of the line, then turn around and go back to the city. Then again, if I let this train go, the next one would be heading in my direction. I'd probably get home faster that way, and I'd definitely save some money. Finally, and not without some regret, I let the doors close and watched as the train began to pull out of the station. And then, as the car gained speed, I could see it there, hanging onto the outside of the rear car all the way in the back. It was the dog man. It was that same dog man and he was hanging onto the back of the train as though this were sport to him. I dove behind the garbage bin and I ducked down, letting the train leave the station. When it felt safe, I poked my head out, and I saw that dogman receding in the distance, still hanging onto the back end of the train heading up north. He hadn't seen me. I expect if he had... He'd have jumped off onto the platform and resumed the chase. By this point, my heart was beating so hard I thought it would break free of my ribs. I was shaking all over. Nothing made sense anymore. The rest of the evening went pretty much as planned and I got home safely. I spent the next few days unable to keep any solid food down. It was like I went back into my past to try to heal my intense depression. But instead, I just got sucker punched and knocked even more off balance as a result. Nobody ever said life was fair, but the dog man may be the least fair of all. Nothing is normal or sane anymore in my life. I feel as though I live in a daytime nightmare ever since. I saw dog man hitching a ride. I'd like to really thank all of you who left such nice comments wishing me well when I was sick. 
They helped more than any aspirin ever could, and I'm grateful. I'd especially like to thank our newest $10 member, Tim Sturgill. He's a number one at the top of the hill. He's never outdone. He's Tim Sturgill. Please join me in thanking Tim Sturgill for making this episode possible. He's so cool. He already saw this episode yesterday, and so can you, by joining our channel memberships at the $10 level. Just click the join link under this or any of our videos to find out more. And now, here's one of the creepier dogman stories we've ever had on this show. It took place over 100 years ago and has been passed down through the contributor's family until his uncle told it to him. It's about a dogman that was old before old was even a word, and we call this old family legend. The Dogman That Couldn't Smell Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a family legend about my uncle Horace, who I guess would actually be my great great uncle or something like that, and his mythic adventure stuck in a cave just a few feet away from a huge old dogman that lacked a vision and the sense of smell. You see, this story was a legend before it was even a story. My great, great, great or whatever Uncle Horace had heard from his elders and peers that there was said to be a giant upright walking dog beast, supposedly eight or even nine feet tall living in a cave nearby. The creature was so old, some suspected he was roaming these same hills in the caveman times. He had long ago lost the tip of his snout as well as a few other body bits and pieces over his very, very long and extremely savage lifetime. According to the stories, he was unable to smell and so it became a dare or a rite of passage into manhood for the teenagers in the area to venture into the cave and then return alive. Since the dogman couldn't smell you, then you had a fighting chance to get in and out unharmed. You had to be as silent as possible, and you had to stay out of the beast's line of vision. The first time my father's brother Cyrus told me this family saga, I was wide-eyed. About the only thing I ever liked in school was when they had us read the old Greek and Roman myths, the Norse myths too, if I recall correctly. That led to my own study of North and South American native mythologies and my personal fascination with the books and lectures of Joseph Campbell. When I was 15 or 16, I wanted to grow up to be the next Ray Harryhausen who was famous for animating mythological monsters like the Cyclops in popular 20th century movies. I wanted to make all the monsters of the ancient myths come alive on screen for a new generation. Instead, I'm a mid-level developer for an analytics firm. Trust me, it's, it's practically the same thing. I remember telling my uncle Cyrus how much his story seemed like an ancient myth already, and he said that was exactly what it was like. But... He believed it anyway. We got into a discussion of whether the myths were based on an original story that mutated over the generations or whether the stories were all symbolic. I've read one theory that the symbols used in the ancient myths translated into star systems used to plot the course of sailing vessels. Like musicians remember every good boy does fine to remember how the notes go. Did sailors once memorize mythological narratives as mnemonics to guide their travels? It's an argument that does at least sometimes seem to have some merit to it. But couldn't the stories have still begun with a spark of truth, no matter what they were used for later on? That was Uncle Cyrus's argument. We don't know how much of our family legend is accurate as it happened, but we have a general faith that there must have been a core kernel of truth that it all sprang from. Either that, or this is one heck of a scary fishtail. I'll tell it as well as I can remember, but I'm sure I'll change some parts without even meaning to. So, my ancestor uncle, who I'm just going to call Horace for the rest of this, listened to the stories of the werewolf man who couldn't smell and the cave he lived in up on the hill. 
He paid attention when the stories were told, and he contemplated the details. Finally, one night at the local pub when he'd had enough courage to drink, he approached a group of men discussing the creature and expressed his desire to actually see the thing for himself. Although the legend was still alive, nobody had actually climbed the mountain to confront the beast in at least a dozen years. My ancestor Horace would be the first in all that time, and as it would turn out, the last ever to attempt the challenge. I gathered that Horace was a young man around that time, whatever that meant in those days. Maybe he was 18 or maybe 21, but he was ready to become a man and looking for a way to prove it, both to himself and to the community at large. He had been practicing being silent, and he had been practicing not being noticed. He was athletic, he was quick-witted, and he felt up to the challenge. All the men agreed to meet him the next morning, and together they would climb the mountain and find the werewolf's cave. On the following day, after the cave had been reached and identified, the men all agreed to stay in the mouth of the vast cavern system and said they would listen for Horace if he should cry out. Should the men need to rescue him or should he perish, then he would have lost the challenge. If he could disappear into the cave far enough to be out of view of the men, then remain there for at least two hours, then he would have passed the challenge whether he encountered the monster or not. If he was able to witness the dogman in less time than that, he need only get back out alive to win the challenge. Horace asked how they would know that he wasn't lying if he said he had seen the beast, and the men just laughed. They all knew it would be very clear on his face if he had actually survived a dogman encounter or was only lying about it. Understanding the parameters, Horace went off, trudging into the darkness and rounding a corner into the complete unknown. Behind him, he left the tribe of his peers, wondering if he would return, and what would be changed if he did. Now I'm going to give you a spoiler up front that Horace has to have survived this story because he is alleged to have been the one who told it for the first time. He couldn't have done that if he hadn't gotten back out. As Horace continued walking deeper and deeper into the tunnels of the cave system, he could still see where he was going because of some kind of ambient lighting that he could not identify. He didn't have any kind of torch or lamp with him, yet he continued on his path. He couldn't figure out if light was sneaking in from the outside or if there was something illuminated underground that was allowing him to continue to see. It was dim, everywhere, but dark, nowhere. Horace claimed he couldn't even see a shadow underneath or behind him. Well, the dog man of legend may not have had a working nose, but Uncle Horace did and he was able to tell when he was beginning to get closer to the lair of a large animal. He didn't know if it would be the dogman, but he was young and curious, and he was dying to find out. Eventually, Horace arrived within view of an opening in the wall, revealing a small room-shaped cavity inside, filling the entire floor of the cavity, was a mass of dirty, matted brown and gray fur that was heaving up and down and emitting a raspy hoarse breathing sound if it wasn't the dogman it was something else large like a bear or a moose an old one at that judging by the bald patches and the amount of graying fur horace stood there for some time watching it breathe wondering if it would be safe to get any closer to try to see what kind of animal that actually was. He didn't have to wonder for long, though, as the creature began choking in his sleep and quickly woke up. He pulled himself up to a bipedal standing position as he gagged and choked, gasping for air desperately. 
Horace could see the beast man fairly clearly, considering the dim lighting. It was the ugliest thing he had ever seen, and from the way it was struggling to breathe, it seemed like he had gotten there, just in time, to witness its demise. Yes, it looked like a dog, I suppose, or it probably had when it was younger. Yes, the tip of the nose seemed to have been lost and healed over decades ago, probably before Horace was even born. The thing looked as old as the hills, as though it had been there gasping and gagging since the dawn of time. When it finished coughing, it stood there, chest heaving, trying to catch its breath. Horace had been too afraid to move ever since he saw the thing, but he was beginning to come out of his daze. He should head back now. He had seen the creature. He only needed to survive the encounter to be declared a winner of the challenge. Yet, still, he stood frozen, staring, gaping, in awe of a myth that turned out to actually be real. The beast turned its head quickly in Horace's direction as it climbed out of its sleeping cavity. Horace, unsure if he had been seen, reacted with his flight reflex. He ran away from his former position, looking back over his shoulder at the dogman, not watching where he was going. If you've ever done that in real life, you may have suffered a comeuppance for it. Similarly, Uncle Horace slipped on some rocks, skidding into the side of the tunnel and causing a small cave-in to result, pinning his right foot to the spot. Trying to pull it out proved quite painful around the ankle, so he was going to have to remove some of the rocks by hand that had become lodged together. It was going to take a minute, and it was going to cause some noise. Looking back, Horace could see the dogman stumbling and staggering in his general direction, and he knew he had run out of time to try to escape. It was now time to make himself as small as possible and to become as quiet as he could. He had to get out of the monster's way and hope it didn't trip over him accidentally. Whether he survived or not was going to be entirely up to sheer luck, and he knew it. Huddling his body as small as he could make it and as far into the right side wall of the tunnel as possible. Horace lie there, on his side, looking up at the largest two-legged creature he was going to witness in his lifetime. The tunnel leading back outside was better lit than the interior of the cave, and Horace allegedly got to witness every detail of the aged, diseased, old dogman body as it ambled past, holding onto the walls for support and also just to tell where he was. Both of the ancient creature's eyes were completely white, and he was almost certainly blind. The way he used his arms and hands, not only for support, but to feel along the cave walls and know where he was, indicated that his eyes were no longer able to function. So he could neither smell nor see Horace, but his ears seemed fine, and his deadly sharp-looking claws came at the end of very long and still strong-looking arms. Horace was wily and he was fast, but the dogman was almost twice as tall as he was, and in close quarters, unable to move his foot, he'd have put his money on the dogman. He hung low to the ground, and my ancestor prayed. The moments spent by him watching the massive, rotting old creature shuffling toward him seem incomprehensible to me. I wouldn't have been able to prevent myself from screaming. I would have gone flat out insane if I was unable to run away as that huge thing got closer. I have nightmares about this part of the story, even as recently as last autumn. To me, that's the scariest place in the world that I could ever imagine being. Watching as the big, taloned hands of the monster scraped down the edges of the cave walls 
coming closer and closer to you. And all you can do in response is to try to make yourself even smaller. What a nightmare. And although I'm sure Horace did his best, it eventually happened that the ends of the creature's fingers came in contact with him. The huge dogman stopped moving, and the tips of his long claws danced over Horace's body, defining its edges and contours and textures. Horace could do nothing but freeze, which he did, until he felt the fingers squeeze around him, and he felt himself being lifted up off of the cave floor. The dogman's hands were so large that Horace was being held by only one of them. The paw was very hand-shaped, and it easily wrapped around my ancestor, holding him tight and eliminating all chance of escape. The dogman's ancient but still mighty arm pulled Horace up out of the pile of stones his foot had been trapped in. To the dogman, this was nothing more difficult than pulling a carrot up out of the ground. But Horace and his ankle were in the land of excruciating, blinding pain for a few moments afterward. I can't imagine he didn't let out a cry of some sort as he endured that. The creature held Horace up in front of its face and began blinking, its aged eyes furiously, straining in the dim light to get an image of what it was holding in its hand. According to the way I was told the story, being that close to the hideous and giant dog-headed beast caused Horace to utterly freak out in panic. He began screaming. He began kicking out into the air, but none of it loosened the big monster's grip around his midsection. I remember asking Cyrus if Horace was afraid of getting eaten or if it was just the sheer ugliness of the monster face that had caused him to lose his marbles. But my uncle admitted he really didn't know, probably a bit of each in all likelihood. Cyrus remembered that the bad odors associated with the creature were a big part of the way he had been told the legend when he was a kid. That was quite likely yet another reason for Horace to lose his mind with fear. I imagine he was smelling the dogman's bad breath, as well as his B.O., and it's not impossible that dogman emits a pheromone that causes fear in humans and other animals smaller than it is. I've heard a lot of modern dogman sighting reports where people claim they feel abnormally afraid, and I'm certainly not the first to speculate that there might be some chemical means to instill fear in their intended prey. Besides the possibility of that, I've heard people discuss the idea that some breeds of dogman can emit sub threshold sound or noise that can cause confusion in their targets. Infrasound is what it's called. Some people think tigers and even Sasquatch may be able to use infrasound to facilitate their hunting. In more accepted science, it is known to be a fact that whales can communicate for miles using infrasound and that elephants can use it and hear it traveling through the ground over great distances as well. It's not all bad, though. When your little pet cat purrs on your lap, it's emitting a range of infrasound that humans enjoy. So, there was my ancestor out of his mind with panic, flailing about and trying to get out of the grip of the blind old dogman as the monster tried to use its old eyes to see one more time. Failing that, according to the way I was told the story, the dogman began using his tongue to taste around and define what he was holding in that way. He didn't seem to like the taste of Horace's overalls, but the leather of his boots wasn't half bad. Horace knew that this thing probably subsisted on anything it could grab, anything that had wandered into the cave. Compared to its usual diet, Horace knew he himself would probably seem like a gourmet meal. The legend says Horace made his peace with his creator, and he prepared to meet him as well. 
It was then that the men charged in from the entrance loudly, bearing torches and moving forward as quickly as they could under the circumstances. Hearing was the one thing that the big old dog man was still good at, and he dropped Horace in order to retreat back deeper into the cave. The men were able to rescue Horace and carry him out of there to safety, but nobody denied him his win. They had all seen him about to be consumed by the legendary dogman. Nobody could doubt that he had survived an ordeal of mythic proportions. A subset of the men had chased the dogman into the cave, but soon realized that the creature had a far better understanding of the interior layout than they did. They soon lost sight of it, yet could hear it howling at them. They reported the howling as seeming to come from every direction at once due to the peculiar characteristics of the cave interior. The men became deeply frightened and called off their search for the dogman. Still, that was the last time any humans ever spoke about seeing that dogman. If anyone else did, they must have been taken out by the creatures since nobody else has ever told another tale like this one, at least not about that particular cave. In all likelihood, my ancestor and those men were the last people in history who ever had to deal with the dog man that couldn't smell the dog man in my dreams dear scary stories nyc i have a story about the dog man for you that i had almost put out of my mind actually it just sort of recently had an update and that's the only reason i'm thinking about it again after all these years you see the house I grew up in started to get visited by a dogman around the time I moved into my teenage years. Maybe I should say I got visited by the dogman more so than the house itself, as he was rarely seen by anyone other than me. And I wasn't really sure that I wasn't having a waking dream each time I saw him, since that's what the expensive psychodoctorologist that my parents hired told me was happening. I'm getting ahead of myself though, let me just try to explain things as they occurred and you can decide for yourself what really happened or what may still be happening. The dog man would visit me so often that I don't remember the first time it happened. I just remember the ritual, which was always very close to the same thing. I would have a horrible feeling of fear and I would realize that I was dreaming or realize that I was waking up. There was the sense that I was waking from a nightmare, but that the world I was waking up into was far worse, far more terrifying than the nightmare reality I was emerging from. I remember having that feeling like, from the frying pan into the fire, the awareness that as frightened as I was, things were about to get one whole heck of a lot more frightening and far more real. I knew I was in mortal danger. I was facing the possibility of losing everything, and it was with that heavy feeling of dread that I would open my eyes and see the thing outside of my window staring at me even before I woke up. It was an old dog, and it had seen its share of bad fights, I could tell. The scars and half-healed wounds on its ancient face told stories of a thousand battles survived. I still wonder what would battle that dog a thousand times. It stood bipedally like a man, which is an unnerving thing for a big old dog to do. It was at once a stately gentleman and a serial killer of an animal, at once savage and noble. I was sharply alarmed that it had any interest in me at all. At that age, I only wanted the interest of girls and other nerds like me. I didn't want this fierce, zen-like gaze appearing outside my window at night. I couldn't understand what those eyes meant. If it wanted to eat me, it could have broken in and done so at any time. Why would it keep coming back just to look at me? 
When I would wake up, the dog man would sometimes just run away or disappear quickly, but most of the time, he would do some strange thing before leaving. One time, he told me that my dreams were feeble. I don't mean he spoke the words, but he gave me a glance or an expression, and I knew I had feeble dreams. And then he ran off into the night. Another night, his eyes seemed to tell me that I should not be sad, because I had a magic box that I could keep my animal flesh in, so that it would not go bad until I had finished eating it. That was true, and I do suppose that Dogman would find a refrigerator a handy item to have. It might sound like a funny anecdote to you, but to me, it was like the Frankenstein monster was waking me up at night to share trivia with me. I didn't care what he liked or disliked about human culture. I just wished he didn't feel so comfortable hanging out on human turf. Every time I woke up knowing that he was there, felt like it could be the last time. Each time I knew the dog man might just stomp me out. He seemed to feel so superior to me. He seemed to hold me in such contempt. And yet he would return over and over again as though he still wanted something from me. When his presence didn't bring me terror, it brought me to the depths of despair. Sometimes he would growl at me and make me lose control of my emotions. I would weep openly. Sometimes he would just do things to make me feel hopeless or unhappy. There were times when he communicated thoughts to me so vile that I can't even relate them to you. I also have never been able to understand why he needed to communicate those things to me in the first place. The only thing I can tell you is that the creature did not lie to me. Years later, I discovered he was telling me facts, but they were facts that I wish I had never become aware of about people who I have never been able to associate with since. He knew things about various people in our town. I think he could listen in on all our brains, but he only understood the parts that a large feral canine predator would grasp. So, in a sense, this was a superior creature to humans, in fact, terrifyingly so. In another sense, though, it was just a big savage canine of some prehistoric variety. It did have access to our thoughts, but... What must it have made of them? Would a hypnopompic fantasy figure give me horrible predictions of a terrible future? Perhaps yes, at least according to the authority figure my parents threw their money at. I think he felt that it was all part of me interacting with other parts of my brain or some such nonsense. When the dog man would say insulting and hurtful, discouraging things to me, the shrink would tell me that meant I was masochistic and self-punishing. Maybe so. But if you ask me, that dog man is just a macho jerk judging the modern generation by a caveman standard. I had a fear of this creature to the point where I was afraid to try to take a picture of it. This might sound strange, but I was more afraid that I would get a good picture of it than anything else. I didn't really want to believe that it was real, while at the same time, I resented being told I was imagining it. Unless you've been in this kind of strange situation, it's hard to explain how conflicted your emotions can become. The last time I remember seeing the creature was less than a week before I was set to leave for college. When the monster looked in at me from outside on that night, I had a sense that this might be my last chance ever to do something that I had been thinking about doing since these experiences had first started. I grabbed the flashlight I kept by my bed at night but never used, and I ran out of my room down the hall and out the back door. Shining the flashlight around outside, I searched for the dog man, who had either been a figment of my imagination, or else had run away into the night. Finally satisfying an urge I'd had for years, I walked over to the area outside my window and shone the light around on the ground. There were no discernible dog prints there at all. No large ones and no small ones. I didn't see tracks of people 
or any kinds of animals there at all. Testing the ground to see how hard it was, I found it easy to make a clear footprint in the soft dirt. If something real had been standing there a minute prior, it would have left a print or two in that soil. As obnoxious and overpriced as he was, I had to accept that the shrink must have been correct. The dogman must not have been real. I left for college convincing myself of this and trying to forget that any of this had ever happened or that I had ever imagined it, whichever. I left that house when I went to college in a different state and I've never slept another night in that horrible room. Wanting to accept the adult version of what happened, I told myself it was all a bunch of waking dreams and I mostly forgot about it. Well, this past year, my niece and her two children stayed at the house for a couple of months. They would still be there now, but their daughter Lila kept insisting she was seeing the big bad wolf staring at her through the bedroom window every night. So it wasn't just me. Of course it wasn't. I knew it wasn't. There was no way it could have been. And yet... If I admit that the phenomenon exists outside of my mind and outside of my dreams, what else do I have to accept as real? And if that dogman is real, then why did it not leave footprints? Is there some kind of existence in between reality and imagination? Could my great niece and I have both had experiences with an intelligent haunting? Could we be interacting with an intelligence from another parallel reality? Can anyone come up with an answer that fits all the strange qualities of the dog man in my dreams? Don't go anywhere. We've got another all new dog man story. But first, I've got a rhyme for today's executive producer, Tim Sturgill, a pex of the heap and top of the hill. Our executive producer is Tim Sturgill. There is no greater man than him our executive producer by the name of tim please join us at thanking tim sturgill for making this episode possible in gratitude we share with him our secret sunday uncensored subscriber stories far too wild to ever run on this channel plus tim gets access to our 15 hours of archived uncensored stories and he gets to see our episodes when i upload them not the next day with the rest of the public you can too just join our paypal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or do what tim sturgill did and click the join link under this or any of our videos and speaking of videos, we've got another one about the dog man coming up right now. And we call this one The Werewolf of San Francisco. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a story for you that happened so long ago, I wasn't even drinking age yet. It's a true story, but you don't have to believe me about that part. What you do have to accept is that I'm about to tell you a werewolf story that took place in San Francisco. When I was 20, I left my family home in suburban Ohio and I went in search of the Summer of Love. The problem was, the Summer of Love had happened in 1967 and I went out on the road in the summer of 68. I landed in San Francisco only to find that the Haight-Ashbury scene had either been exaggerated in the media of the day or else had already degenerated into something I found unappealing. Still, San Francisco was a beautiful city at the time, where the freedom of spirit will never be allowed again in my lifetime. On the day in question, I had wandered around the city until I found a weird-looking concrete structure with the words San Francisco Heights chiseled formally into it. It wasn't just a staircase. It was a monument featuring two different staircases, both eventually leading up to the same place, somewhere up in the sky. That was the exact kind of hippy-dippy thing I had come to San Francisco to find, so I eagerly made my way up those monumental stairs. When I finished mounting them, I was surprised to find another staircase in the same style across the street. I discovered I was on 14th Avenue and Moraga, or Moraga, it looks like the next staircase led up to a park on the top of a mountain up in the clouds. Maybe it was just foggy that day, but 
That park up there looked like Mount Olympus to my young eyes, and I crossed that street to continue my climb, feeling as though I were participating in some epic adventure, wondering where it would all lead. Well, once I climbed those stairs, I saw this incredibly tall staircase going straight up. By this point, I had become fascinated with the neighborhood, and rather than proceed directly up to the park in the clouds, I took a left on the upper portion of 14th Avenue, which is also called 14th Avenue, same as the lower portion. I decided I wanted to try to walk around this park above me and understand where I really was. Remember, we didn't have cell phones or GPS back then, and I wasn't carrying a paper map with me either. I was just wandering, observing, and learning. I walked past some private homes until I got to the corner and made a right onto what eventually turns into 15th Avenue. Somehow, I ended up on the lower portion of the avenue, which was split in two, same as 14th Avenue on the other side. I was looking up to my right at the top of a tall concrete wall on which rested the higher portion of the avenue, and then past it, the top of the mountain. I now know it's called Grand View Park up there. I imagine it's because you can see some grand views from that far up, but I've never researched the naming of the park. Maybe it was just donated to the city by a guy named Cuthbert P. Grandview III or some such thing. For all I know, by the time you're reading this, old General Grandview has been canceled and the park might be called Chairman Mao Hill. Well, whatever the mountaintop is called, I found a staircase to my left leading down and I decided to say goodbye to that neighborhood for now. I was thirsty and I also needed to get something to eat and then maybe I could come back later in the day or the next day to finish the climb. As I looked up past the wall separating the park from me to give it one last glance, I saw the darndest thing. There was a Planet of the Apes kind of guy running down the hill in a crazy way right toward me. That movie had just come out a few months earlier and I was a big fan of it, so my eyes were instantly drawn to a big gorilla-looking man that was right there in broad daylight. By gorilla, I mean the gorilla characters from the movie. I don't mean real-life gorillas. This was basically a humanoid, and although he was a little more hunched over than most men might be, it wasn't by that much. He was generally racing down the hill in what, for the most part, could have been a human way. I remember looking up and gaping at the scene, wondering if they were shooting a movie up there or if some guy was just on a particularly primeval trip. By the way, I was not on any mind-altering substances other than my growing hunger and thirst and exhaustion. I wouldn't blame you if you doubted what I'm telling you I saw, but I have no doubt at all of what I was witnessing. It was a man covered in dark fur like a gorilla from that movie, but not wearing the leather outfits that they wore. This guy seemed to be covered in nothing but his fur, and I assumed it was a Halloween costume being used on a summer day for a reason I had not yet determined. Some dust and pebbles rolled down the hill and began landing on me a split second before I saw the dark creature leaping off the top of the tall wall, heading down toward my level. Silhouetted for a brief moment against the sky, I saw that this was not a gorilla, nor was it a chimp or an orangutan. This was something with a long, snaggle-toothed snout and tall, pointed ears. This was either a wolf that ran upright, or a werewolf, or at least someone costumed in that way. Before the creature or a costumed man even landed on the avenue, I was off down the steps to my left. Once I started down, I saw that they never ended. It's the most incredibly tall public staircase, and as I ran down it, hearing the werewolf creature racing up behind me, I felt like I was going to faint from the shock and from the effort. This staircase is the famous 16th Avenue tiled staircase, but I don't remember if it was tiled back then. I was running down them, and to see the tiles, you have to run up. I don't know what era the tiles were put in, though. Maybe the story predates them. After all, I was not concerned with decorations in that moment. I was concerned with survival, and I was in a state of extreme panic. I don't know what that creature was running from, but whatever it was, 
That dog man was completely afraid of it. The dog's eyes were so wide open that I could see the whites around the edges. It was flying down the steps in a chaotic and terrifying fashion. If it didn't knock me down when it ran past me, it might trip and go into a roll, taking both of us all the rest of the way down this incredibly tall and remarkably steep outdoor staircase. There are periodic levels on these stairs, and I guess you'd call them small landings on either side. When I began running out of steam, and that dogman got too close to me behind, I dove left onto some dirt and curled into a fetal position while the big monster roared past. It had to have been six feet tall or taller, probably a minimum of 220 pounds. It was a pretty big man-sized thing. Gasping for air, I stood up and I watched as the most remarkable living thing I ever saw made it all the way to the bottom of the staircase, caused some women to scream and back off, and then continued to run straight down the street and out of my sight. I have no idea where he was going, but he sure was in a hurry to get there. I have told this story to a few people over the years, and one time recently I heard it told on a Zoom call by someone else that I had told it to years earlier. My friend was retelling the story, but set it at the Lincoln Park steps over near the Land's End Lookout and the Labyrinth. That staircase is beautiful, but it's not nearly as tall as the one I got chased down. Let's face it, San Francisco is hilly to say the least, and there are a lot of staircases needed to walk from one part of town to another. So as far as where the dogman was running to, I have no guess for you. There are big parks not too far from there, but they're more in the line of Central Park sort of places, not really nature preserves where a large carnivore could subsist. And as for where I saw it running out of, Grandview Park? Well, that's just a patch of grass and a few trees. It's a tiny place, at least by dogman standards. It wouldn't be possible for him to live there. He'd be seen instantly, and he would have been seen there for years. I can't figure out where he came from or where he went to. If you ask me, my story is quite literally impossible. And yet, it really did happen. So, how? How did I not only witness, but almost get run over by the werewolf of San Francisco? Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it. You can become a channel member by clicking the join link below. Then you can check our community page to find the links to 10 hours or more of secret, uncensored dogman stories too wild to be told on this channel. Your other option is to join our paid subscribers club at peterbernard.com. That's Peter's homemade club where he will personally email you the links as well as occasional secret club messages. You may also be included as an executive producer in a future episode. You have a scary experience you want to tell us about? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or else call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 Less Scary. The machine cuts off every few minutes, so if you have a long story, please keep calling back and we'll piece it together later on. Good night and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.